I'm a worship leader, and you know that means that I spend a considerable amount of time each week planning and preparing for this gathering that's going to happen on Sunday as my church gathers to worship Jesus together. When Sunday arrives, I, as I'm pulling out of my driveway to turn left into this 20-minute trip outside of my neighborhood to my church, I am always struck with the fact that my neighbors are never going to go to that service with me. And that's a problem if the mission of the church is to bring people to it. So Matt and Hillary are our neighbors that live directly across the street from us who we absolutely love. And here's the thing about them. They would tell you in a minute that they aren't religious at all. And in fact, they have had to overcome uh, some of their personal stereotypes about people like us, you know, Jesus-y people, you know, uh, in order to be our friends. And we love them for it, you know. We have small kids, they have small kids. We get angry about the same things. We laugh about the same things. I mean, they've truly become great friends of ours. I mean, I don't know anything about the Bible, but I think I've picked up along the way that that wasn't what Jesus was about. Judging people, telling them you can or can't do this. I mean, and especially if you're poor or you are destitute or, you know, aren't those the people that you want to take in? Isn't those the people, aren't those people that Jesus said to, to bring closer and help? So I don't understand why the church is so mean. Even though our culture, if you can listen through the cynicism and the anger and the bitterness that we tend to get from them as they react to what they see you know, through the media or whatever, if you can listen through that, there is this intuition in them about who Jesus is. And the anger and the cynicism and the bitterness comes in when they cannot see him in us and even more when they perceive that we don't understand that they can't see him in us. So it seemed to me that we need to ask ourselves today what kind of a life would be considered so intriguing, so questionable, so unlikely that people would ask us about our faith and going to church on Sunday is not intriguing. So we got this kind of bizarre idea that we could be at work at the water cooler. It's like, hey, you know, what did you do on the weekend? It's like, oh, I went to a party. I went to a bar. I saw a movie. I went to church. And like people are going to go, tell me more about that. But we know that they don't. They don't find that intriguing. They just think that that's respectable or normal behavior. No, I think Christians have to rediscover what it is to evoke curiosity. keep trying to dress up Sunday, you know? I mean, it really seems like we keep putting all of our energy into this experience that happens on Sunday. I mean, all of our time, money, energy, thought, creativity is all trying to get forced through this Sunday experience. And the base assumption that's driving all that is that if we make it awesome, people will come and they'll encounter God and they'll be transformed and they'll become a full-fledged disciple of Jesus, and that's a lot to assume. But what we see in the life of Jesus is we see Jesus forming his ideals and heart into people in relational discipleship. And that, I think, is what's required as we go into the future. I think that's kind of the big aha that, the, that many, many, many churches are having right now. So we have churched our people, but we have not discipled them. So the Gathering Network, a couple of years ago when it was all just banging, you know, hundreds of people in the room, I mean, we were worshiping God like crazy, great sermons were happening. But as we worshiped Jesus together in that space, as we got together and we just began to cry out to Him and just long for Him, what happened was He formed in us this heart 
to see wrong things made right in our city. And the thing that was holding that back, the thing that was keeping that from happening was the structure of our gathering. Because it was dependent on people coming to us rather than us going to people. You know, one of the things that we learned through that season is that the experience that we have on Sunday as we gather as a church, just, it just can't bear the weight of discipleship and mission. And so some other vehicle needed to get set in motion in our life together as a church. And that became for us a missional community. Missional communities are spiritual families that exist around a mission, not just community, loving God radically, loving one another um, in a committed and devoted way, and then lastly, loving the world around them, you know, like sharing Jesus generously in all ways. I think when we see what it is that's happening in society and this longing for a reconnection and a sense of community again, we have the opportunity to begin building these, these extended families that are made both out of blood and non-blood relationships these extended families in what it is that the church has come to call missional communities. Those missional communities, as they live together, as they, as they seek to serve together, as they pray and worship together, they will become clearer and clearer about a sense of identity. In fact, they'll go from being a structure that we would call a missional community to a family on mission together. And then also what that community does together is it serves a cause bigger than itself in the way of Jesus. And we have found so much life in this vehicle, you know, in this way of living life together. We still gather as a church every couple of weeks to, to be equipped and to, and to worship and pray together because it's essential to who we are. But we had to find this rhythm of gathering and scattering. So the last five years, we've been um, growing in our competence at making disciples that can make a disciple. He died for the sins that we bear. He was without sin and he was convicted without sin. Um, and so he took our sin on his shoulders. And honestly, it's been quite the challenge. It's hard. It's hard to change gears. It's hard to change lanes like that when, when you've been taught and brought up to lead the church in one way and then now we're going, whoa, man, we're doing this in a completely different way now. We're realizing how much time it takes, but at the end of all that, we're seeing incredible things happen in our personal lives, but also in the life of our church. It's amazing. It's going to be a, it's a really special night. We're really thankful to have all of you in our lives, obviously. We are absolutely caught <laughs> in between two worlds right now. I mean, we're, we're on this bridge of, of leaving you know, one mode and ad adapting our lives to a new way of life. And we're simply trying to say, these are the questions that we're asking right now. And these are the things that we're wrestling with right now. And and I just want to say what I believe with my whole heart is that our cities cannot change. They will not change if we expect people to come to us. We cannot change a city from the sanctuary. The fact that we assume we can just says that somewhere along the way we, we lost the plot. My neighbors know that, you know? And they know the plot is Jesus. They know the plot is Jesus. And I am not my own. This world is not my home. And I am not my own.